welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the final day of the EY 2020 Global Blockchain Summit and it's Technology Deep Dive Day. I'm Paul Brody and in spite of everything that I have said and done over the last two days on camera, I believe that I am still the Global Blockchain Leader at EY. I will confess I'm not checking my email and I have no plans to do so until tomorrow morning. Um, if you've tuned in for the last couple of days or you missed part of them, all the presentations are now up on our registration site for the last two days. And uh, the videos, the full day videos are posted on YouTube. And the fastest way to get those links is actually just to go to my Twitter account, which is at pbrody, P-B-R-O-D-Y, and follow the links that I have there. We have another terrific agenda for you today. And John, if you'll put up our agenda slide for today, I will take you through it. We're going to start off with Arwen Holmes, who is our blockchain chief technology officer. And he is gonna give an interview, uh, an overview really of our blockchain technology strategy. Uh, and he's gonna talk about sort of how we are building blockchain technology specifically for the purpose of enabling enterprise business transactions. Uh, we also have a special guest star for that presentation, Steve Dodd from Dell Technologies, which is gonna be fantastic. After that, we are doing a deep dive into blockchain privacy specifically Nightfall and zero knowledge proofs. We have our cryptography and math superstars on the line. We'll have Dr. Duncan Westland in London, uh, Chitanya Kanda from Hyderabad, Youssef El Husni from Paris, and Miranda Wood, I think, also from London. And I, I want to apologize in advance. There's been a lot of requests. They are not going to be signing autographs today, uh, even though they do absolutely. These are, these are the only cryptographers and math experts I know who have uh, a fan club. After that, we are covering our baseline protocol in depth with OpsChains 4.0. Uh, and then we're gonna do, uh, our final section today is gonna be a tour of blockchain.ey.com, which is really the one-stop shopping location. So everything that we do in blockchain, we are gonna start delivering to blockchain.ey.com with APIs, GraphQL APIs, ERP integration, and web user interfaces so that uh, if you want to go directly to the blockchain, you can, but if you want to go easily and simply and in a way that's very familiar, it's going to be very simple for companies to integrate and make use of this technology. And I'll just remind you again, if you want to get a sample of blockchain.ey.com, our uh, smart contract review service is available in free, uh, is free for the public. And, and as of this week, it is no longer in beta. Um, we, as we have had in the last couple of days, We've got two more guest stars today for our short breaks. The first is Christine Kim from Coindesk, and the second is Hudson Jameson from the Ethereum Foundation. So they're gonna liven up the, uh, the in-between parts of conversation. Now, before I get us started with Arwen's presentation, we have a, our first kind of surprise special guest star, which is EY's Global Chief Innovation Officer, Jeff Wong. I thought it would be great uh, to have Jeff Wong here to just talk a little bit about EY's innovation strategy, uh, because, Funding state-of-the-art math, cryptography, encryption, just doesn't sort of seem like the kind of thing we'd expect an accounting firm to do. So, so Jeff, welcome. Um, tell us kind of how do you see EY's investments in R&D and core technology as part of the firm's future path? Well, first of all, Paul, you still are the global blockchain leader. Uh, I've been checking my emails this morning and it looks like you're in the clear so far, but we still have day three to go. Um, and welcome <laughs> to everybody who's on the call. Uh, we're having an amazing, you, you are holding an amazing event. Congratulations to you and the entire blockchain team. I hope everyone out there is staying healthy. So in terms of advanced technologies and emerging technologies, we're really making a concerted effort to make investments at the front edge and cutting edge of these new emergent technologies. And the reason why is because this is go these are the technologies that are going to define our future. So when we look at, looked at it and we thought about what we should do when I joined the firm five years ago, it was very clear that we needed not just a one-off set of investments, but a systematic program where we could globalize our investment and make sure we're at every corner that we need to be in, in the latest and greatest things that are happening in the world. So Jeff, aside from blockchain, which I know is your favorite and most beloved emerging technology, what other kinds of technologies is the firm investing in? Yeah, so we have investments across all, I guess, the buzzwords that you would see. So futuristic things like quantum, more common 
commonly known terms like IoT and 3D printing and of course drone technologies where we're making sure we understand what's really happening at the front edge. But our two biggest investments are artificial intelligence, of course, and blockchain, of course. And while our AI investments are really uh, playing out in a very significant way today, uh, to your point, Paul, I think blockchain right now has the most explosive potential in front of us. And in fact, from what I can see, we're starting to see the beginning signals of that explosion that real big burst where we see the implications and ramifications of a blockchain technology unleashed on the world of going forward right now. Fantastic. Now, before I, I tie this up, I want to ask you, is there a unifying theme, right? EY is such a sprawling organization in professional services. We do investment advisory work. We do accounting audit professionals, you know, uh, legal outside the U.S. Is there kind of a big unifying theme across these technology investments? Well, it's really interesting, Paul, because I think you're right. When people think about EY, they think about us as an accounting firm or a tax firm or a consulting firm. Um, I think when we look at EY, we think about data and relationships. And when we think about data and relationships, well, investments in technology to enhance those that the data that we have and take advantage of the relationships that we have and bringing that together and tying together technology is really the mindset that we're using when we think about EY as a firm and we think about where we're headed. And then the second thing, and, and I'm repeating myself a little bit here, is that emerging and advanced technologies are going to define the future. And at the pace at which things are changing, they're really defining today, right? And how we have to think about investments we make right now. And so that's why we're making such a concerted effort, a global effort to make these investments right now, particularly into concepts, particularly into blockchain. Awesome. So thank you, Jeff. First of all, just um, since we're here in public on the record, I just want to say extra thank you for tripling our R&D budget this year and for joining us to kick off day three of the conference. Oh, thank you, Paul. And while I'm going to sign off video right now, I'm signing back in as a guest so I can watch the rest of the day. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, we're just about ready to tee up our first talk of the day. Before that, I need to do my final round of, of thank yous for making today's events possible in the last three days. First of all, uh, and first and foremost, uh, Suraj Jarnandadan in uh, India, Marika Klein-Smith and Kaylin Smigelski and Lindsay Weichelt here in the U.S. And actually also Eli uh, uh, Wolfson, Mihir Kokani and John Frechette here in the U.S. as well. Uh, and then secondly, I want to give one more shout out to the Ethereum Finance Forum and JT Nicole on Reddit. Uh, the moderators there have been absolutely amazing. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for the standard and the quality of the questions that we've been getting over the course of this event. And with that, uh, I want to just say thank you again. And I want to hand this over to my esteemed colleague, um, uh, Arwen Holmes, who's going to start uh, the conversation with his technology overview. So hello, everyone. Um, we're now here in day three, uh, maybe a little biased on my end, but I think the most exciting day of the summit yet. I'm also curious uh, which Paul Brody t-shirt is winning on Reddit right now. Um, if there's not a subreddit that started, I certainly encourage somebody to start one. Um, on another fashion related topic, um, I don't think that the live stream today can handle my hair. Um, so I'm going to save that bandwidth for our presenters later today. Um, so as Paul mentioned, I'm Arwen Holmes, our global blockchain CTO. I'm responsible for our technology operations and our engineering efforts globally as it relates to blockchain. And I'm really excited today to share a bit with you about how we're enabling blockchains for business. Um, so just dumping, jumping right into the agenda. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna to talk briefly about our technology vision and strategy, um, how we're building enterprise blockchain software and, and really given the promise of the technology, the importance of collaboration. So just jumping right in first and foremost, the technology vision and strategy, if you've been tuning in for the past few days, this should really come as no surprise. The blockchains that are ever to, to deliver upon their full promise, uh, public blockchains must triumph. Now, as it relates to enterprises, what we mean by this is we really want to enable businesses to transact privately and securely on public networks and in a way that's regulatory compliant. Um, lots of things to unpack here but this is our vision for blockchain technology. And when we talk about the full promise of blockchain, for me personally, this has evolved beyond my passion for technology. Um, as I became a father of two over the course of my blockchain journey, and then with this technology, we can efficiently manage exchange of value, 
We can unlock value currently trapped in traditional models, as you may have heard in the past few days. Um, but we really have an opportunity now to foster a future that's really more accountable, ultimately better and safer for generations to follow. This is really what drives me with regards to blockchain and what makes me excited about doing this in UI. Um, this is really true when we think about things like provenance, traceability, certificates of authenticity, and really a renewed focus on value that we collectively bring to our ecosystems. Um, I also want to bring back one slide that was raised in Paul's keynote on Tuesday. Um, so many uh, enterprises and individuals have explored private blockchains, but so few of those have really progressed beyond a proof of concept. Um, we did a, a commission survey with Forrester's Help um, last November, and, and of the enterprise executives that were surveyed, um, you know, 75% of them, it's an overwhelming number, but a nice validation for us, believe that public blockchains were in their future. But I'll pose another question. Um, it's great that it's in their future, but how far into the future is that adoption? Um, well, we believe if the past is any sort of indicator, we're really just getting started. If we take a look at cloud adoption, for example, if you look at 2006, that was when Amazon Web Services launched and, and really only about a decade later in 2017, if you look at the majority of ERPs, SAPs, Oracles, and the like, um, those installs largely shifted to the cloud. If I take another example um, that we're all familiar with online banking, um, banking online as we know it today, it really, really came to fruition back in 1995. Now what's not depicted here is when that effort really started and banks really started trying to do that back in the mid eighties. So uh, that took them a decade to really get out the door. Um, I'll fast forward a little bit, um, we were around the time when you may have received your internet on a compact disc, for those that are old enough to remember. Um, but by 2000, 80% of US banks offered electronic banking, but even still they had very few customers adopting it. Um, that didn't really balloon until after the Y2K scare ended and after the dot-com bubble, when, when a lot of folks really had access to the internet then, um, and the first milestone for banks, uh, the first bank to hit 3 million customers happened then. Um, thankfully today, we have a lot of folks that, um, that do their banking online um, as, we're, as we're not able to go into branches in the way that we used to. Um, now, if I bring this back to blockchain, um, 2009, January, Bitcoin launched. Uh, and even then it took about a year and a half before the first commercial purchase actually happened using Bitcoin. That's fondly known as uh, Bitcoin Pizza Day today. Um, 10,000 Bitcoins were used to purchase two Papa John's pizzas, probably the largest uh, or the most expensive uh, pizza delivery ever. Um, now if we fast forward again in 2015, we had Ethereum launching, uh, significant programmability um, with smart contracts. And then a proliferation of protocols and proof of concepts as blockchain peaked its type cycle. And really right now we're just starting to get to the really meaningful work. Um, so four months ago, December of 2019, we launched blockchain at ua.com, which brings me to our strategy. So it's, it's important to note um, that UI has really been at this for the past four years in a big way um, with regards to our first blockchain development starting in 2016. Um, well, the first few years included hundreds, literally hundreds of proof of concept builds and a lot of learnings. Um, I really want to emphasize that our blockchain strategy today has evolved. It goes beyond showing the art of the possible. Really, what we're showing to the world is what's technically feasible, but more importantly, we're working to make it commercially viable. This is also evident where there are increasing client demand um, and commitments for production-focused builds. Um, so solutions today really need to be more than just technically feasible. They need to be secure, cost-effective, and easy to use. And to further illustrate our journey, um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the last two years of blockchain at UI and highlight some of the milestones. So at our summit two years ago, we announced our UI blockchain analyzer, which is largely an internal offering um, supporting our audit business, um, but we were able to audit uh, multiple blockchain protocols and that platform continues to expand today, supporting more and more protocols and, and even users uh, beyond our audit practice. Um, so more to come on that later. Um, in October of 2018, this also marks our foray into doing privacy on, on the public mainnet. Um, we were the first to 
show that private transactions were technically feasible. Although when we did this, it was quite costly at roughly hundred dollars a transaction. So maybe not all that commercially viable, but it only took us about six months um, to release Nightfall to public domain, marking EY's first open source contribution of blockchain technology. And this allowed us to execute private transactions on Ethereum and others for less than $10. Um, now with other advancements, and you'll hear more about the details on this in, in the talk following mine, uh, techniques like batching shared in December of last year, you can now execute those transactions for under a dollar. And as I mentioned before, um, in December, we also launched our SaaS platform with our first, uh, first product offering, the Smart Contract Review Tool, as a public open beta. And as Paul mentioned, no longer beta. Um, so for me, what's really exciting about this and for our practice is that we now have a platform that brings our portfolio of offerings, services, and business applications really to everyone. So a lot more to come on that. Um, and just last month, um, I do want to highlight that we released our second substantial contribution to public domain, the baseline protocol. And you may have heard a bit about that on, on day one's closing keynote. Um, but this was in collaboration with Consensus and Microsoft, and it's been an amazing effort. It's been underway since the better half of last year, and really excited about the engagement that we're having right now in the broader community. Um, so as the header says, spoiler, as we'll see you later today, there's quite a bit more on the way. And, and I hope you guys stay tuned for the remainder of the day to catch that. So now I'm just gonna pivot quickly to share about four key points on how we're building enterprise blockchain software at EY. And hopefully this is beneficial for others that are looking to do the same. And so number one is design and build for public blockchains. And you'll understand soon why I've crossed out the word first here. Now one, one hard data requirement in taking this approach is that no sensitive enterprise or personal data is ever stored on chain. And this is especially true for public blockchains, but we wouldn't recommend it for private blockchains either, especially if you wanna satisfy regulations and be compliant with things like GDPR or HIPAA. And some of the benefits that we get by focusing on this approach is that we focus on one code base. And in particular, we made a strategic decision to focus on Ethereum and focusing on that single protocol allows us to be extremely efficient with regards to development. We aren't managing separate forks for a private network deployment from a public network one. Um, it allows us to minimize technical debt. If you were to do the other approach of building for a private blockchain first, and you're simplifying the scope, that might allow you to get something done quicker and get to market sooner, but that reach is going to be limited and you're gonna run into a number of other challenges. In regards to the participants, security considerations, and data governance, those are things that you wouldn't have addressed if you just built for private. And, and making assumptions that will ultimately involve significant rework if you decide to deploy to a public network in the future. So, uh, which brings me to the third point is that really deployment anywhere. So as we're building on Ethereum, um, there is a public network for that. And you can also deploy that privately. Um, so we really have the flexibility to do both of those things without changing a line of code. And then lastly, we do get economies of scale when we're building for public. So this includes adoption of common standards from the community, um, reusable assets, and a global community to help test and help mature and secure the solutions. Um, number two, leverage appropriate token models that, that use open standards. And this is how we enable value exchange across business applications. And another core point um, for our vision is that, you know, we believe these applications should be interoperable on the same network. I know there's a lot of talk about having different protocols interoperate with one another, and it's a challenging task uh, and something that Baseline also looks to address is how do you maintain consistency across different state machines? Um, but the focus that we see here, that ultimately the scale that we'll get is if we're building those solutions to interoperate on the same network. In order for that to happen, we need to be leveraging the same common standards uh, that for that adoption to scale, everybody needs to be speaking the same language. Now, um, tokenization itself, um, we believe that you know tokens and smart contracts will be the standard way in which companies will do business with one another, um, but the tokenization of the asset itself, be it a real asset or a virtual one, often involves more than just its digital twin on the blockchain. So if I look at this bike, you know, is this, this, is this representing the actual physical asset, the bike itself? Is this the legal ownership of that asset? Because they're not always the same things, right? If I purchase this bike online and it's shipped to me, 
well, the payment would entitle me to the ownership right away, but logistically that's going to go to somebody else first before it gets to me. So if I want to track and trace that item, that can be handled with a simple ERC-721 token. But if I want to do other things like uh, support other financial instruments like insurance policies or loans, you're going to be challenged to do that if you don't have the right token model. So really important to look at what is the value being exchanged and, and not just for today's use case, but tomorrow's. And with the right token model, um, it's really important to, to get this right. The ecosystems will ideally have the flexibility to establish new business models, like the ones that we see emerging in decentralized finance. So we really want to empower that. Um, so we also did this very early on, but the concept of being able to nest tokens, right? If it was a, a product like an electronic car, um, the battery you might want to have managed separate from the actual vehicle itself, right? Um, given how costly it is and, and that you may not want to own that or maybe you want to lease that but you want to own the vehicle. But there's lots of different things that could be unlocked if you have the right flexible token models. And number three, maintaining principles of decentralization and portability. And these are really core concepts to blockchain. If I just look at the Bitcoin network, which launched back in 2009, so it's been more than a decade, it's really only experienced two downtime events that entire time. The last major one was in 2013. So it's been up 100% of the time since. Um, or we'll be really challenged to look at other systems that have that kind of durability. Um, so some of the main uh, extensions of this is there's no single points of failure. And it's, it's often not enough as you're building blockchain solutions that the blockchain nodes only be decentralized. And this needs to apply to the applications as well, APIs and user interface that operate on top of the blockchain. Hence why we have dApps as well as the underlying infrastructure needs that, need, uh, that also needs to be decentralized. Um, an alternative would, you know, if we don't do that, would be going back to what we've been used to, right? Reverting to the traditional centralized operations um, that are subject to vendor lock-in and single points of failure and, and more cost of disaster recovery plans to ensure high availability. Another thing that we do to help with portability and decentralization is that we containerize all of our assets. So we do this leveraging Docker and Kubernetes and to give us the flexibility of managing deployments across hybrid infrastructures, be that in the cloud or on premise. And, and thirdly, we, we use open source technologies quite heavily, right? Um, they, they can ideally run in different environments and, and preferably they're not, they're not also resulting in vendor lock-in. It's important that we're doing this so that we're maximizing adoption across an ecosystem that we can't size in the future, right? And it's important that we're maintaining the optionality so everybody feels open to join. Um, and, and lastly, number four, prioritizing ease of use. Um, so there's, there's lots of cases of this. Uh, if you look at other technologies too, but we really need to make it easy for enterprises to onboard develop, deploy, and reliably connect uh, to the off-chain world. This includes other systems of record, uh, IoT networks and sensors that you might have, you know, artificial intelligence applications that may need to sit on top of a blockchain and they can get reliable data from the blockchain. Um, but if I look at other references in the past, if you go back to the late 90s and we think about ease of use in the world of web portals, Google first launched with nothing more than a logo, a text box, and a button, right? They focused on making it really easy and doing one thing extremely well. And the same could be said for video conferencing technology, which has been around for ages. And I know with all of us um, in lockdown and working from home, you know, Zoom being a relatively new player in the space, it's, it's been very intuitive to use. And, and they actually ballooned from 10 million users in December and given the crisis to over 2 million users by March, right? So that is an astronomical increase in adoption. Right, uh, but it was largely due to the fact it was easy to use and it was reliable for the base, the customer base that they had. Um, but that, that said, that this accelerated adoption also isn't without its challenges, right? Um, and, and, and folks like Zoom and others haven't gone unscathed with that either. So the, the last point I want to make regarding prioritizing ease of use is that with this increased adoption, that security flaws are often exposed, but that ultimately matures the technology. And we've seen this in numerous cases in the blockchain world too. Right? Whenever a hack happens, uh, millions of dollars could be lost, but at the end of the day, we've come out, uh, we've come out with a better technology. Right? So then that, sometimes the price of innovation. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna talk with about our next section here. I think um, Joseph Lubin said on Tuesday during our closing keynote that um, blockchain 
is a, a collaboration network technology um, and the network isn't something that the network effect isn't something that you turn off. I do think that the current COVID-19 crisis is definitely an accelerator for all kinds of change. And, you know, we're all, we're all um, looking and seeing what that's going to be. Um, but I do believe one thing is certain, especially during these uncertain times, and that's um, that we're better together. Um, so in terms of this picture here, a um, few things go better together than, uh, than milk and cookies. Um, this is my daughter's idea for our past Halloween with my son. Um, the, the points I want to stress here is that blockchains really foster collaboration across so many dimensions. Um, and as you'll see later today, like we are continuing to advance blockchain technology. We're pushing the limits of zero knowledge proof cryptography, as well as building a suite of commercially viable business applications and foundational services that you'll soon be able to find on blockchain.ui.com. We at UI are making really good progress, but there's still a lot of work to be done right, for blockchain to deliver on its full potential and significant advancements are being realized through true collaboration. I would like to call particular attention to the baseline protocol, um, which can be accessed um, through this QR code here, or you can visit docs.baseline-protocol.org. Um, and I just really want to encourage everybody to get involved. Um, and you can stay tuned later today for a deep dive on that topic. Uh, at the end of the day, blockchain is really a team sport and I'm hoping that together we can really unlock its full potential. So um, with that, um, I'd like to close by just saying that, that we at EUI are very fortunate to sit at the nexus where so many industries and technologies and talents converge, but it's gonna take a lot more than a village for us to build this better working world. And we're really truly grateful for the, the ongoing efforts of all of you, the folks taking the time to join our three-day summit you know, large and small enterprises out there, enthusiastic open source communities, the technologies we build upon and everybody in between to make this a reality. Um, and in the spirit of that collaboration, um, it really gives me great pleasure to welcome a very special guest that's joining me today. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to take this time now to, to welcome uh, Steve Todd. Steve, how are you doing? Good, um, can you see me? Right. My hair is not causing bandwidth issues either, as you notice. Yes, I, I can see you perfectly fine. Just let me get uh, set up here. Um, so stop my share, I think. Great. Um, yes, very good. So Steve, Steve is a fellow at Dell Technologies and, and really a pleasure to have you joining us today, Steve. Um, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and some of the background that you have in blockchain technology? Sure. Uh, first thing I'd like to start with is that I've been in research and development for my entire career. So when I think about blockchain, I think about it from an R&D lens. And you mentioned uh, the introduction of Ethereum in 2015. As we were watching from the office of the CTO, we recognized instantly that someday uh, on this new application development platform, we would see uh, business logic that would be valuable inside the enterprise, right? So we, as a development community, brought Ethereum on-prem and, and started to understand it. And we saw the challenges associated with, with bringing public chain inside an enterprise. So we, uh, we began a significant R&D investment inside Dell, which I can talk about. And lo and behold, a couple years later, we, as Dell, we needed a public chain inside our company to solve some sticky business problems. So, you know, what we thought would happen actually came true for ourselves. And that's when we started the partnership with EY, because you developed some, uh, the ops chain framework, which allowed us to, to take a look at reducing our costs significantly. So as we work together, uh, on those problems and those challenges with bringing public chain on-prem, uh, we solved them with our R&D and some of our, our own solutions, right? And, and so today we're at the point where uh, Dell and EY together, we've got solutions that can help anybody, any enterprise that, that wants to implement uh, public chain applications in their environments. So, um, I wanted to also say it's cold in New England today. When I woke up, it was below freezing. I appreciate the fireside invitation. So, so let's chat about this hot topic. 
Yeah, so uh, appreciate that. And yeah, really looking forward to our discussion too. Um, so can you tell me, I guess to start off with, with some challenges. So, so what, what challenge do you foresee enterprises facing to adopt blockchain today? Sure. Well, the one where we see the most friction is uh, the whole reason for bringing a public chain inside the enterprise is to integrate with the systems of record that we already have inside the enterprise, right? So we want to combine our business logic with this new logic coming in on the public chain. So when you think about the data integration problems represented by that, uh, you have some of your uh, data in a SaaS application or an on-prem application. You have different types of databases. You may even have your own internal blockchain, right? And if you think about all the point-to-point -point connections and all the coding that has to be done to bring data in between uh, the public chain application and your internal systems of record, that's a huge startup cost right, in terms of development training and coding. And so one of the ways we have solved that is through use of Dell's Boomi data integration platform, right? That's a drag and drop uh, data integration platform. So it's a no code environment where we've written uh, public blockchain connectors that can be graphically dropped into your data flows. So that just is an accelerant, right, for that very first problem of data integration in an on-prem environment. Yeah, and we've seen that challenge too. It's, it's, um, we don't control what the systems of record are for the various ecosystem participants in, a, in any given blockchain network, right? So I do think that that's certainly one viable option is, is to help make that easier for enterprises to do is to leverage that Boomi technology. What, what are some other challenges that you foresee with, with blockchain adoption? So the other challenges have to do, first of all, with um, that uh, workload crossing from a public boundary over into a private one. So you've got uh, issues of security. You've got issues of uh, different network protocols that are used in a public setting versus maybe a firewall setting. Um, these are all just um, multi-cloud problems, right? And you want to solve them in a way where uh, that particular on-prem enterprise is not locked in, as you mentioned, right? So they may want to use some sort of converged infrastructure Azure Stack solution, or maybe a containerized VMware solution. So as we looked at that problem of crossing the hybrid boundary, right, we thought of, we thought of VMware, right? VMware does that all day long, right, in terms of secure, uh, network, identity management across that hybrid boundary. Uh, once you're on-prem, however, there's another set of challenges that we talked about. One of them is uptime, right? If, if you're a participant in a public chain and they're waiting for your business logic to execute and you've had a failure and you can't respond, things are going to break down, right? So how can we uh, configure the infrastructure on-prem with enough nodes how can we maintain uh, the uptime? How can we do any load balancing to make sure that it's, it's a responsive, robust system? So of course, we, that's what we do, right, at Dell in terms of, of trusted infrastructure, resilient uptime. And, uh, and so we've solved some of those problems with, with those solutions. Yeah, and I do see that in, in our work too. It's, it is a significant gap in enterprises. If they do want to host on-prem, there's not a lot of enterprise uh, capabilities available for them to do that. A lot, there's managed service offerings that have emerged over the past year or two, you know, on things like Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services, mm -hmm. but that's really a cloud only, right? So um, I think making sure that we are staying true to decentralization, allowing this optionality. Um, I do think VMware especially, given that that, that has footprints across uh, the major cloud providers too, is one certain, one certain way to do that. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the critical success factors that you see clients um, should be thinking about um, when evaluating blockchain? What are the things yeah. that will, will help them be successful in using the technology? Well, I think you just used the word and, and the word is decentralization, right? Um, our customers, just like we did in our R&D context, right? We explored decentralization technologies because when you think about what, what we're doing when we bring public chains on-prem, we're taking a decentralized technology 
and we're bringing it into a highly centralized environment, right? All of our security systems, for example, are usually implemented in a centralized way. Uh, so I, my, my main advice to clients is look at decentralization in general, decentralized identity management, decentralized storage systems, decentralized application deployment. Uh, make sure as a client that you, you understand the differences um, that decentralization brings and it'll give you a much better uh, feel for how the, they should be deployed on-prem. And, and that's what that we did in, in our research team in the CTO office. We've spent several years of fully understanding the capabilities that are available in terms of decentralization technologies. So yeah, and there's, there, I mean, there's certainly obviously cases where blockchain is not uh, ideal, right? Uh, if we look at uh, high compute workloads that need really high transactions per second, yeah, continue to centralize those in traditional methods, right? That's not really where the blockchain shines, at least mm -hmm. not today, right? It's not a real-time transaction technology. It's batch transaction processing by definition, right? There are blocks. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I agree that, you know, they need to think about that, but it's important that you're using the technology where it fits best. We found at EY that the sweet spot for blockchain is really where there's multiple parties involved and there's really shared complex business logic. And that's where they assume the blockchain itself seems to outshine mm -hmm. traditional methods. Um, but the challenges we see um, do come with um, governance of the network too and, and adoption of the ecosystem. In particular, this happens more as a challenge when you're talking about a private network, right? Where there needs to be a network operator. Um, right. Give, given the theme of our summit on um, going public, um, what are your thoughts on public blockchains? So I like public blockchains for a couple of different reasons. First of all, because it's public, we were able to bring it uh, inside and use it. It was publicly available, right? And, and by exploring it and, and the fact that Ethereum can be deployed internally uh, very quickly and easily, you start to see how does it fit with the environment. So that's, that's one thing I like about the public chain. Uh, the second thing I like about it is, is the open source aspect, right? So as we try to understand uh, the nuances and the capabilities of the software, we had access to the source code, right? And, and uh, by being, being able to deeply inspect that source code, that really gave us uh, much better insight about how we could start bringing um, D apps and, and public applications uh, on prem. So, um, myself having a lengthy background in open source technologies, I'm just curious to uh, know what you think regarding the role of collaboration in open source technologies and really helping blockchain progress further on the maturity curve. So, what, what are your views on that? Yeah, great question. The um, I mentioned the significant R and D investment that Dallas made. And one of those is the formation of a blockchain team inside VMware. And that team committed to open source collaboration specifically around Ethereum. Because one of the, the things we noticed when we brought uh, Ethereum inside and, and tested it a little bit more deeply, what happens um, in an enterprise context when you have node failures to the performance, right? How does a consensus algorithm behave in that environment, right? That's very different from a public setting. And our VMware employees uh, engaged openly with the, the Ethereum consensus developers, and they worked on enhancements to that consensus algorithm and got it to the point where it behaved much better in the face of node failures. Right, and, and all of the learning that uh, our open source, you know, all of our developers did internally we contributed that new consensus engine back to the industry in the form of Project Concord, right? So now as, as we move forward with uh, public chains, if we have a use case where we want to bring something inside uh, and we need maybe a little bit more performance from those nodes from whatever reason, uh, that technology is openly available. And VMware actually has a blockchain that's Ethereum compatible. So now, you know, our two teams at EY and Dell, we're talking about, um, can we use that, that new approach? So I think um, 
all of our success and our learnings have really come from uh, public chain experimentation and collaboration. That's great. And this is um, very much like UI's open source efforts to advance privacy on the mainnet uh, through our, you know, our contributions of Nightfall and the baseline protocol. Um, I understand that uh, Dell has also recently launched another open source initiative to address data confidence. And I'm just learning a little bit about this, but it seems like it might be a nice complement to baseline. Would you mind sharing some details regarding that? Right. So we are, we are about, Dell is about to release some code called Project Alvarium to the Linux Foundation. And Alvarium represents a little bit of a different take on public blockchains. Uh, a lot of people are looking at public chains and saying, I can um, reduce my costs inside my business by you, you know, improving my royalty payments or my ability to do rebates. But there's a class of customers that are interested in using data assets as a new revenue stream, right? So can I register uh, a data asset that I own as a company on a public chain for the purpose of data sale? And, and we're seeing the rise of data marketplaces. And what Project Alvarium is attempting to do is create an open standard way to annotate the ownership, provenance, history, and trustworthiness of data uh, that eventually can be valued, right? Can we assign a score or a value to that data? So if, uh, as we move forward with, with uh, the, the enterprise approach, of bringing applications in to the enterprise, can we also take our on-prem app applications and move them out and register them in the public chain for sale? So Avarium promised to be a, a pretty interesting project and we invite people to participate this year. I know we're, uh, we're, we're coming up on time and, and really excited to hear about that project more, um, but how do you see our Dell EY partnership bringing collective value to enterprises and maybe sharing a little bit about how Dell is adopting technology internally. Sure, when you, when you think about what Dell does, right, uh, I'm talking to you from my Dell laptop today. Mm -hmm. when, when I purchased that Dell laptop, well, actually it was free, uh, but, uh, but we had a whole set of royalties that need to be distributed, for example, Microsoft. When we uh, build our Dell-wide solutions that include our storage systems, our servers, our VMware, Boomi, we bring them all together, the, the revenue that comes in, again, needs to be divided up. And that process can take uh, weeks, right, to, to figure out all the paperwork of how people get paid. Uh, your team has solved that with OpsChain. Right, so by bringing that application inside Dell, we're hoping to, to realize significant business benefits. And the way we would build that solution is to take your technology and use our products and our solutions that we've been working on for the last five years, bundle them together, uh, and all of a sudden we have a pattern, right? We have a solution that can help other companies that want to cross this boundary from public into on-prem. That's, that's really excellent. Um, I know we have about a minute left, so I want to wrap up quickly here. But just to summarize for our audience, uh, what's, what are some final thoughts, main points that you want um, our audience to come away with from this chat? I would say, uh, number one, public chains are here to stay. Uh, the applications that are being developed on public chains can and will help your business. And when you start to solve that problem of how you're going to do that, I just know that Dell and EY, um, we're, we're years ahead, right? And, and we have a solutions that can make an impact immediately. Uh, looking forward to see if there's any Q&A or chat uh, for people that, that might have some questions about that and we can address those throughout the day. Yeah, um, and, and we certainly will. Unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of content that we had to jam in this time frame, and I, I just wanna take this moment um, to, to thank you, Steve, for your time. I couldn't agree more. We're really excited to have Dell as a partner in building enterprise uh, blockchain applications. And, and really my final points and also for my keynote for enterprises to really fully adopt blockchain, they gotta be easy to use. They must be easy to deploy and we have to make it easy for them to connect to other systems. So uh, thank you again, Steve. It's been a sincere pleasure having you join us. And my pleasure, Paul, thank you. Thank you. Paul, back to you.
Ar Arwin and Steve, thank you both so much. I, that was amazing. I, I have three really important takeaways from that presentation. Number one, we heard Dell say uh, uh, public blockchains are here to stay. Number two, ops chain being used, uh, going to be used inside of Dell and ops chain on Dell products and solutions to other clients. So uh, this is a, a truly special announcement and we are excited. There's, there's going to be a ton of questions. I know there's a, there's a ton already flowing on YouTube as well. Right now, I want to go to our little break. Uh, and in the break, we have our brilliant, amazing, super guest stars. And every day we've had incredible guest stars. And uh, we've got two fantastic ones today. First of all, Hudson Jameson from the Ethereum Foundation. And secondly, Christine Kim from uh, Coindesk. So with that, let me uh, start just uh, maybe Christine, just please introduce yourself and uh, uh, tell us what you do a little bit about your background and then give us some of your thoughts of, of what you've seen uh, both earlier today and over the last couple of days. For sure. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, at the conference, this virtual conference, which is actually the first one that I've done uh, amidst this time of quarantine. I haven't done a virtual conference before, so this is really quite exciting. Um, as you said, my name is Christine and I work for Coindesk. Um, I started off as an intern for Coindesk back in 2018. Um, I then transitioned into a role as a tech reporter, focusing primarily on technical developments on the Ethereum blockchain. So a lot of this conversation around um, what is capable for enterprises on the Ethereum blockchain um, is quite interesting to me. Uh, I transitioned actually again into um, a new role at Coindesk, which is a research analyst. So I'm now on the research team at Coindesk. And that started in November of 2019. So I'm just getting into the role and um, familiarizing myself with certain uh, data analytics and metrics that are specific to um, gauging um, gauging uh, activity on on uh, these public networks. So that's a little bit about myself. I'll turn it back to you, Paul. Thank you. And we have our second guest star, which is Hudson Jameson from the Ethereum Foundation. Hudson, I, I have to say, you know, uh, we at EY have shown the Ethereum Foundation just as much love as we possibly can. We love Ethereum. We support Ethereum. Tell us just briefly about yourself and what you do at the Ethereum Foundation. Sure thing. So yeah, my name's Hudson. I uh, work at the Ethereum Foundation doing a number of roles. Um, one of them is uh, community work. Another one is uh, internal DevOps and security. And I also do a lot with the governance structures of Ethereum. So like how decisions are made, our specifications process, and our core developer meetings. Uh, previously, I worked from 2014 to 2016 as the blockchain lead at USAA, which is a banking and insurance company in the US. Um, after that, uh, 2016 went to the Ethereum Foundation and uh, have been helping out there ever since. I love my job. I love uh, this community and I love that Enterprise uh, is moving on to mainnet. So, uh, and actually maybe I'll start with you, Jameson, since you just introduced yourself. Uh, Dell, joining the club, EY, Microsoft. Um, are large enterprises going to be fully welcome in this community that's very committed to open source or are we going to be treated with some level of suspicion? You know, I will, I will admit it used to be the kind of thing where these open source developers were kind of wary of enterprises a lot of the time because of the, the initial uh, private chain uh, specifications that they were coming out with that was kind of against this decentralization theme, against this openness theme. Um, I think that uh, projects that are building, that are going to these uh, meetings with these open source developers and contributing code and specifications and standards, they're the kind of uh, people that we want in the ecosystem. And I think they're rapidly becoming more and more accepted. It's more about the individual contributions and the entity contributions that are really helping everyone more so than uh, someone coming in and trying to just chill their business. Uh, and uh, so that sounds very encouraging. Christine, uh, uh, let me ask you. So you talk to, in your role as a reporter and as an analyst, you talk to tons of companies and entities and organizations around the world. Uh, how do they see the future of Ethereum with enterprises? 
That's a really good question, because to be honest, I think the topic of enterprise blockchain has really died over the years. It used to be a major buzzword and there was a lot of hype around it, but I think the slow development of true enterprise, enterprise applications on public blockchains um, has slowed um, just uh, very much interest. So I actually haven't been talking very much specifically about enterprise blockchain applications, which is why I think this conference and the conversation I hope it sparks um, will really go somewhere. Um, and today when Dell had announced, you know, their partnership now with EY, I was really curious to know a little bit more detail about what was that initial problem that they used blockchain to solve? I think that so many uh, conversations, at least in the past that I've had with, with uh, different sources on enterprise, enterprise blockchain has been that this is a very experimental, um, you know, early stages, uh, kind of in an early stages phase, and that through the development and through um, the development of, of public blockchain technology, of, of Ethereum growing to scale, it will one day be useful for enterprises, but the idea that it's immediately um, accessible and, and, and um, I can bring some kind of a positive impact, I think uh, is something that needs to be highlighted and, and talked about a little bit more uh, in detail. Well, I, I can actually answer your question that you posed in there. The, the thing the thing that specifically is being solved at Dell is their software licensing relationship uh, initially with Microsoft. So if you may recall, EY is building the Xbox video game software licensing network. And uh, Microsoft has started, we're working with Microsoft and Dell and others to extend this beyond video game licensing. So that was the very initial problem. But I think the kicker, the thing that pushed things over the line for Dell and is moving things over the line for other companies is this emergency of privacy tools on the blockchain. If you're a public company, you can't disclose. If you, if you want to do your supply chain operations on the public blockchain and everyone can see what you're doing, they can see how many lemons you're buying and how many uh, uh, you know, pieces of pork you're purchasing. That's material information. Privacy is the engineering problem that had to be solved. And in fact, it's the topic of our next discussion. I want to flip back to Jane Hudson um, and, and ask you, you know, uh, the Ethereum uh, public infrastructure has always been uh, has largely been with, without a big privacy focus. Uh, do you see in your interactions with the developers in the community, do you see a big shift towards doing much more privacy centric work? Because this for, for corporations, I can't speak for individuals, but I think for enterprises without a high degree of comfort around privacy and security, they just can't proceed. Yes, that's a really good question. So I would say that Right now, privacy is maybe one of the top three major things we're looking at as a community, besides things like scaling and getting, you know, Ethereum 2.0 out the door and uh, things like that, getting the economics right. Privacy is really becoming a bigger issue. There are some uh, open source initiatives such as Tornado Cash and uh, I, you know, Nightfall uh, and others that are using uh, zero knowledge proofs and other related technologies uh, that are really, really promising. And I know the Ethereum Foundation is uh, funding a lot of the researchers who are going through and making these, uh, you know, new, newest trusted setups and working with Aztec and EY and all these other companies on privacy solutions. Privacy is really important. And unlike uh, other blockchains that have privacy as their base layer, Ethereum is a lot more flexible and that you can have privacy on selected pieces of your infrastructure. So I think for enterprises, that's a really big deal. Um, I know Arwen had mentioned having nested ERC-721 tokens where you have the car battery versus the car tokenized. And I can see a future where you have a uh, like a car and you decide to go to a restaurant and that restaurant says, hey, when are you getting here? We're gonna give you a quarter of a penny or a quarter of this token uh, in order to take your private information. And it's like, if you wanna sell your information, there's a use case right there. But you have that section as private when you're sending it over, but you can publicly have the idea of this restaurant reaching out to all these individuals so that there's more transparency. So there's just, you know, use cases out the wazoo, and it's going to be really cool to see these come to fruition. 
Yes, indeed. Now, uh, I want to turn back to Christine and uh, ask you a little bit about what you're seeing in the way of privacy. You're talking to lots of different companies. You're doing your own research. What's the, where does it fit in the overall sort of priority in the Ethereum kind of ecosystem? I have to confess, I haven't been keeping as many tabs on Ethereum as I used to when I was a tech reporter. Um, but I'm just going to think back into some of the most recent developments that I had heard of. Um, I think mixers were a big topic on Ethereum for privacy. And I'd be curious actually uh, to learn a little bit more about um, how applications for that has developed. I think as Hat Hudson had said, a really interesting part about Ethereum is that privacy wasn't built into the main net. And so uh, it's second layer technologies and solutions that are being developed now and innovated uh, to bring um, a certain level of, of privacy for users. And one of the interesting points that I, I think really ties into this discussion of privacy and its, its importance um, is this idea that for enterprise blockchains, there is public blockchain specifically, but also private blockchains, sensitive information and, and personal data shouldn't actually be stored in this network. And so that idea that you, that you should be finding a different use case for, uh, that enterprises should be finding a different use case for blockchains rather than you know, storing sensitive personal data um, and, and how privacy kind of still plays a role, even if your data isn't sensitive or even if your data isn't personal, still valuing the privacy of whatever this um, non-sensitive, non-personal data is, um, I think, I think that is a really interesting conversation and dynamic that, um, cert that technologies on Ethereum uh, perhaps haven't yet touched on, but um, if there is going to be more enterprise activity on Ethereum, we'll have to discuss and we'll have to um, see more innovation in. Well, this was actually one of the single hardest things that we had to deal with. We, we kept going over this and people kept saying, well, how are you gonna secure the data? And at first the initial thought was, you know, we should encrypt it, but the truth is, Encrypted data is still vulnerable to eventually being decrypted. And so, you know, we kept coming back to this idea of like, well, what if we could have absolutely no data on the blockchain at all? What if, if uh, uh, your sensitive data never went on chain, you had off chain links, you could disconnect it. And that's where that ended up being, that ended up feeding into the baseline kind of vision, which was no sensitive data on the blockchain at all. Um, let me uh, kick it back over to uh, Hudson. Uh, I would like uh, for you and, and uh, then Christine to give kind of a couple closing comments before we go into the next section. What are you looking for or what would you like to see over the next year or so with regard to the maturing state of privacy on the blockchain? So over the next year, I want to see more people actually using it. I want to see people value their privacy more. And the biggest thing with that is it, you can you can value privacy without having something to hide. Uh, that's something a lot of people don't understand, and uh, that's something that I think just needs to be driven home. And as the more people who use these privacy solutions, just like in a decentralized network, the more uh, you know resilient it's going to be. Especially with these things like mixers, where the more people you participate, the uh, the more privacy you have. I think I'd also like to see more uh, general and public information about how privacy is built on the blockchain because of the unique technical infrastructure that blockchains do present to users. There's many cases where privacy is, is tooted and said to be um, secure when actually it isn't and bugs are found and uh, people's, yeah, sensitive and personal information is, is, um, is released. So um, I hope that there is a greater level of understanding around how privacy is built on a blockchain um, for users just to be able to um, check and, and hopefully be able to test themselves before using uh, a certain before uh, before using a certain uh, application that says that you know their personal information or or um, their transaction information won't be won't be visible on the blockchain. Excellent. Christine and Hudson, see you at the next break. Thank you for your commentary. 